Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. Things could be going better for Kamala Harris and worse for Donald Trump, but it is hard to see how. Harris unveiled her choice for vice president, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, sparking enthusiastic cheers from party loyalists and earning solid praise from the media. The least well-known of the finalists for the VP slot, Walls combines a record of solid progressive achievements as governor with a down-to-earth Midwestern personal biography, enlisting in the Army at 17 and serving for 24 years, an over-decade-long career as a high school teacher and coach, and a term in Congress during which he distinguished himself as the most skilled marksman in either party. Take that, MAGA Nation. Walls also managed to penetrate the media cacophony with a memorable jab at Trump and J.D. Vance, labeling them as weird. A term that undersells their danger, but certainly strikes a nerve and undermines the Republican ticket, which has been appearing increasingly doer and uncool. There's no doubt that Harris's successes have gotten deep under Trump's skin and thrown him completely off his game. Trump held a press conference seemingly aimed at highlighting Harris's failure to do the same, but it devolved into one of his most incoherent and sour performances to date. He seems consumed by resentment and physically sallow. He's failed to soothe the nerves of important donors, and puzzlingly, He's staging only a handful of campaign events, despite a pressing need to regain some media attention from Harris. This week, we also learned that Trump came far closer than recognized to being indicted in the Arizona false electors case. It brought home the latent danger to him of that prosecution, in which Jenna Ellis has agreed to cooperate against Rudy Giuliani and Trump's other closest advisors again underscoring that the campaign is for Trump not just a political struggle, but a fight for his own liberty. To chronicle another in a string of solid weeks for Kamala Harris, who ascended to the presumed nomination less than three weeks ago, and another frustrating stretch for Donald Trump, who grappled for media attention while his VP pick was bogged down in self-made controversy, we welcome three of the country's most prominent and savvy commentators. And they are Jen Rubin, an opinion columnist for The Washington Post and an MSNBC contributor. Prior to her career in journalism, Jen worked as a labor law attorney for two decades. She's the author of the book Resistance, How Women Saved Democracy from Donald Trump, and a frequent and very valuable guest here on Talking Feds. Thanks, as always, for returning, Jen Rubin. My pleasure, and a Bolt alumni along with Harry, class of 86. There you have it. Not just an alumni, but the same class. And I always forget, who was first that year? <laughs> ah, never mind. All right, Charlie Sykes, a founder and former editor-at-large of The Bulwark, an MSNBC contributor also, and the author of nine, count them, nine books, most recently, How the Right Lost Its Mind. His Substack newsletter, much recommended, is called to the contrary. Welcome, as always, Charlie Sykes. Thank you. Bienvenue. He's a polyglot, is Charlie Sykes. That's between us. And then finally, Tara Setmeyer, the co-founder and CEO of the Seneca Project. Formerly, Tara was a CNN political commentator and Republican communications director on Capitol Hill. She's a resident scholar at the UVA Center for Politics. Always a pleasure to welcome you, Tara. Great to be here. Thank you. So we remain in the middle of this heady honeymoon period for the Democratic ticket of Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. Their rallies are boisterous, upbeat, and fawningly covered. Let's start with the country's reception to Walls and what it shows about the race Kamala Harris will run. Charlie, I want to start with you because on Tuesday, you called Walls not a safe pick and argued that Shapiro, Governor Josh Shapiro, the consensus runner-up here, would appeal more to centrists. I myself didn't know Walls, many of us didn't, given his recent reception. 
Do you still hold that view? Well, no. I mean, I think we were all getting uh, introduced to this. Uh, my initial reaction was I was surprised. I was disappointed. I thought that uh, Josh Shapiro was a layup. I thought he was the easy and obvious choice. Check the most important boxes. Kamala Harris needs to answer the question, are you a far left extremist? Are you going to reach out to the center? And of course, you need to win the Electoral College. I thought Josh Shapiro was going to be the candidate there. But having said that, when you see Tim Walls, you're seeing why he's getting such a positive reception. He's one of those rare things in politics these days. He's a normal guy who actually speaks Midwest. He's somebody that I certainly recognize here in Wisconsin. He's the guy down the street that you meet at the hardware store. He's the coach that you had in high school. He's the best teacher you had in high school. So when I said he wasn't a safe pick, it was in part because I don't think people knew who he was. He does um, have some ideological baggage. We can get to that a little bit later. But he presents himself in an impressive way. Now, again, it's very, very early days. Number two picks generally do not make a big difference in the end. Governors have had a hard time scaling up, so we're going to have to see how he plays. But he's got a, he's had a great start so far, and the reception, I think, shows that. Yeah, and you know, I hadn't seen many of these things. Everything you said also, how much do you love that he wins year in, year out the Marksman Award within the Congress? It's very rare in politics these days. He's the embodiment of the citizen legislator of your, someone who isn't only a political animal. I do want to follow up, though, on the point you made. I think people were generally assuming Shapiro plays a bit to the right and maybe draws flack from the left and mollifies the right. Walls plays a bit to the left and does the opposite. Is that correct, however? How is the Harris-Walls campaign positioning Walls in terms of his political relationship with her? Well, again, I think that so far, what we've seen is, is that, and I, and I got a lot of flack on social media for saying this. What's social media for, really? Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> but he, he reads as a more moderate guy, as you point out. I mean, he's a gun owner. And I think that one of the key things is that we were thinking of him balancing the ticket right-left. He balances it in a different way as well. The big divide in American politics is urban versus rural. He is a guy who talks to rural America. He's from the beer track rather than the wine track. And he certainly does not come off and sound like a coastal elite. So I think that that's the way that they have positioned him so far. I saw two nods. I couldn't agree more. I think we as pundits, and I also like Josh Shapiro, tend to think that ideology, kind of going down the checkpoint of positions, is what drives people or what makes for a balanced ticket. That's not how ordinary people, I think, view politics. And I think Charlie is exactly right. If you had Shapiro and Harris, it would have been a very typical democratic, elite school, sort of urban ticket and would not have, I think, been a lean towards some of these other parts of the country. So I think in picking him, she does a couple things. One, she says to the country, I'm going to compete everywhere. And that's an important thing for Democrats to say. They have essentially ignored rural and small town Americas. They are not going to win those areas, but they have to narrow those margins in order then to run up the score in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. They can't lose by these huge margins and expect to win in those swing states. So he helps her perhaps in a variety of places with this kind of messaging. And I think the other thing is that she is making the argument and that it's the Republicans who are in the far right regions and kind of off the track. And then Americans basically like the stuff that Democrats do. Maybe it sounds radical to say, give kids free lunch and breakfast, but when you present it, it's overwhelmingly popular. So he has a way of selling these progressive policies in a way that makes them sound like common sense things that most people want. I did an analysis of like a hundred different positions on various issues. And the issues that get like 70% approval when you ask Republicans, Democrats, independents are often things that we think of as center left. If you ask them, do you want to you know, make investments in green energy? Do you want to even increase benefits for the poor? People say yes, even a fair number of Republicans. 
So our idea of right left isn't necessarily what the public thinks. And having a governor of a state that is considered to be well run, a guy who's very popular, a guy who won in rural areas, a uh, red district with a very high score, I think helps interpret her and her agenda for that part of the country. In other words, to say, hey, all you people in Minnesota, you loved all this stuff that Walls did. We're going to do that kind of stuff for the rest of the country. I think that's exactly right, to Jen's point, that I come from center right. And so maybe back when politics were normal, some of the things that Governor Walz did in Minnesota, we would have said, oh, no, no, that's progressive when we were having policy arguments and the merits of those. Today in this climate, I don't think that matters as much. People are exhausted. They are dejected. They're sick and tired of the nastiness in politics. And Tim Walz is America's dad. And I'm telling you, the feisty grandpa thing is appealing because People are sick and tired of Donald Trump and MAGA and the nastiness of that entire brand and what we've been dragged through as a country for the last nine years since he came down that escalator and started off attacking immigrants as rapists and murderers. He's a breath of fresh air. And some of these policy squabbles that we probably as right of center people would have been glad to argue the merits of 10 years ago. No one cares about that now, really, as much as they do about the future of our country looking like some dystopian hellscape from The Handmaid's Tale, particularly for women, versus maybe having some arguments over whether we should be funding Head Start or, I don't know, whatever other, quote, progressive policies that Tim Walls may be in favor of or has implemented in, in Minnesota. The idea of the joyful warrior versus the jaded weirdos, I think is a juxtaposition that the Trump folks lose because they just look mean and they look angry. Going after the Tim Waltz, Kamala Harris vision of America, it just, it's so different. And I relish the opportunity for this argument because it's a bigger, it's a macro 30,000 foot argument at this point of what kind of America do we want to live in here? I, I Listen, I hope we get back to the day where we can start arguing over policy differences, uh, truly, instead of having to argue over whether we want our country to look like an authoritarian, fascist, dystopian hellscape, or whether, you know, we have a joyful, future forward looking, positive view of America. I am actually fascinated by the fact that with the Waltz pick, And with the way Kamala Harris has so far executed her candidacy, I mean, it's very young. For goodness sakes, we're only, what, not even three weeks in? It feels like it's been six months. We're three weeks into this. And she has really done this flawlessly. Now, she's got a lot of things to do moving forward. We haven't had the big interviews yet. We haven't had some of the testing yet. But this as a rollout could not have gotten any better textbook. And it set this narrative of a very upbeat, patriotic, positive. This is what America looks like. This is what the American dream is, the imagery, all of it, taking that away from MAGA because they thought they had ownership over that and they don't. And Tim Walls coming out and doing the Minnesota nice but feisty grandpa thing (laughs) makes any hard line positions he may have had look very palatable, to Jen's point, to the average American, especially the moderates, in the swing states who do not want the absolute crazy that is coming out of Donald Trump. And that press conference we saw this week puts a real spotlight on that. I agree in part, but I I also want to have a little bit of a reality check. Jen's point about the fact that we tend to see things in ideological terms when people actually make decisions on on impressions and personalities. Tim Wall's uh, superpower, particularly in contrast to J.D. Vance, is that he's not weird, he's normal, He's likable. These are really important things, you know, particularly in in politics. When we are talking to voters, one of the first things they want to know is, do you respect me? Will you listen to me? Do you have contempt for me? If they believe that you have contempt for them, they're not going to listen to any of your policies on school, lunch, or education. If they think you share their values, you can make a lot of uh, progress. And I think that's uh, where Tim Walls comes down. But let's not put ourselves in our own bubble to think that 
there are not issues out there that Trump and the Republicans are going to exploit. And I just, I want to put this on the table because, you know, I'm watching social media here in Wisconsin. I'm hearing from people in Wisconsin, swing voters, generally who, you know, share our view, your view of what's happening. But I've seen how this works in the past. We want to talk about maybe, you know, free lunch for kids in schools. They will weaponize the Minnesota policies on trans children. They're going to, you know, hit every one of these things. They're pushing out right now a picture of walls at a abolish ICE rally. Uh, so all of these things, they're going to try to find weaknesses that are out of the mainstream. And I will tell you that in rural Wisconsin, I mean, there's a reason why Donald Trump went out of his way in his incoherent rants yesterday to, to mention the trans issue. That is a powerful issue, and they're going to use that. So there are positions that they will exploit. Whether it makes a difference, I'm not totally convinced, because I also, this is where I'm coming around to, to Jen's point, is that I do think that there's a, a macro wave building out there, this optimism versus pessimism, the people who really love America to this dark dystopian vision, looking to the future as opposed to litigating the past. This has a real 2008 vibe to me. And I remember some of these campaigns when you suddenly have that wave. As a former, you know, conservative talk show host, I remember back in 1992 when everybody was absolutely convinced that when people found out that Bill Clinton had marched against the Vietnam War in Moscow, it was done. It was over. Yeah. There's always that thing that you think is going to make a difference. And then in retrospect, you realize, no, you know what? This was going to happen. People were making a decision and they were willing to dismiss things. The other thing that I think we all need to keep in mind is how fast the news cycle works, that there are stories that back in the day would have dominated the media for a couple of weeks that pop up on a Sunday and are completely forgotten by Monday. And it's really difficult to kind of determine that. So anyone who says that they really know where we're going on this is, you know, maybe getting a little ahead of their skis because, I mean, I, I do think the wave is real. It is tangible. It is not just a sugar high at this point, but... It is early days, and we don't we don't know how all those issues play out. And, and the right wing and the Trump world is very, very effective at planting these memes, some of them extremely misleading, in social media and having them, you know, penetrate into the electorate. It's interesting. Republicans have, for many, many cycles, chastised Democrats for not saying America is the greatest country on earth. You know what Kamala Harris said yesterday? America is the greatest place in the world. I love that. Her very short speech at the UAW, people should go back and take a look at it. This was an almost perfect and very Reagan-esque speech. She's saying, this is the greatest country in the world. We believe in the possibility of America. America is for all of us. This is what Republicans used to chide Democrats ad nausea, saying they're not patriotic, they're always down on the country, they can only see what's wrong with it. It has been a complete role reversal. And that has so much more salience than kind of a list of policy issues for people. I think so. And I think God bless him. Joe Biden getting out of the way also gives people an opportunity to say, let's get rid of all of these guys, meaning this whole generation of baby boomers. Can we try something new? Can we have like some new faces? Granted, she's been on the stage for a while, but it's not like having a Biden, you know, Trump choice. People are just tired of seeing these people. And the telltale sign, Biden's favorability ratings have gone way up since he decided he wasn't running for president. So as long as people know, hey, I don't have to listen to him for another four years, <laughs> he's doing a fine job, which is a little sad, but it's how people think. It is. They just want these people to be gone. That's the point I was making before about how Kamala Harris and Tim Walls have taken back that imagery and those concepts of what it means to be American. I'm glad you brought up the UAW speech, which should have been broadcast in its entirety instead of Donald Trump's or at least run back side to side or back to back because Donald Trump's press conference was a rambling mess of insanity coming from a lunatic who is clearly in the denouement of his life and career. But we needed to see the side by side of what Kamala Harris did at that UAW meeting and the ringing endorsement from their leadership. 
you're right. It reminded me of Reagan in the 80s. And even how she's handled the, the chance of, of the lock him up stuff at the rallies has been excellent because it's taking the high road. At a couple of the big rallies since she announced Waltz, the, the crowd has chanted lock him up because she's a prosecutor and she's made the point, truthfully, that he's a felon. <laughs> and then now, I guess if any time it's appropriate to yell lock him up, it would be it would be now, unlike with Hillary, who was not a criminal and still isn't. But she said, listen, we're going to let the courts handle that which was the exact right response. And she did it in a way that wasn't angry. It was, it was very matter of fact and very like, you know, we're going to let the courts handle that because that's in America. That's how we do it. And I thought that was a brilliant way to kind of let them vent that and have that, but also to go back to the fact that we are still a rule of law country that respects our institutions and the independence of our institutions, unlike what Donald Trump wants to do. So all of those things combined, I think, changed the entire complexion and attitude of the way this election is going to be run. To Charlie's point, listen, I'm no Pollyanna here. This is going to be really ugly. We've already seen it. Trump has already tried it, questioning Kamala Harris's race and coming up with these asinine, insulting nicknames for her, mispronouncing and misspelling her name. The stolen valor accusation which from J.D. Vance, which is just so unbecoming and despicable, despicable, given that Waltz has served 24 years in the National Guard and was honorably discharged and put his retirement papers in before they knew anything about getting deployed possibly to Iraq. So the stolen valor attempt here could be something that catches on the right wing. But average Americans look at that and go, wait a minute, this guy served for 24 years honorably in the National Guard and he's beloved. What are you doing? You just look, they just look like cranks. And it's very unbecoming of of people who served. You see veterans who've said, listen, I may not vote for him, but you don't do this. And so it's backfiring. They're going through this old playbook. And let's also, for your audience to understand, Chris Lasavita was the architect of the swift voting in 2004 against John Kerry. Well, it was successful there, but it's not going to be successful this time around. They're pulling out the old playbook, and it's a very, very different type of election. So I agree with what everyone has said, and I don't want to take the airtime to repeat it, but just to, especially Jen and Tara's point, you know, this is what elections are about. We uh, almost castigate the American people. They are not paying attention. When will they pay attention? Reading and writing and hearing our policy is kind of dull, but man, here they are. And you put it really well, I thought, Tara, a joyful breath of fresh air. And you take it in in that way, and it has a real impact. I just want to sort of underscore that point. It's a vibe. It's a it vibe is. for it's, sure. They're the cool kids now, and he's the cool dad. Yes. And that matters in junior <laughs> high and it matters in politics. <laughs> but we all agree with Charlie that, you know, won't always be this way. We, we see the seeds of the attacks on both Harris and Walls. So, so far, no purchase. Could the Democrats get too heady? Could they start to see this as not a razor thin uh, turnout uh, election, kind of as it was before the first debate and go too high? Or do you think basically we both are and they understand we are in the same hand to hand combat over uh, a very small number of people in swing states and that just isn't changing? So, Harry, it's funny that I was actually thinking about this exact question because I heard somebody last night say, this, this feels like 2016 all over again. I think he was talking about the media. And, you know, as I thought about it, I, thought, I remember 2016 very, very well. And this is not feeling like 2016. In 2016, Democrats, they were appalled by Donald Trump, but no one thought he had a chance to win. I mean, remember that? It was absolutely unthinkable. It was insane, but it was impossible. So Hillary Clinton never visited Wisconsin during the 2016 campaign. Kamala Harris has already been here to here twice. There was complacency on top of complete denial. I don't sense any of that anymore. I mean, it's always a danger. But given the experience of 2016, given what we've gone through over the last eight years, I think it, it is less so. I think there was a real danger early in the year. When it was Biden versus Trump, that they, where they had the double haters, people just hated this choice. They were not motivated. They were not engaged. They are motivated. They are enthusiastic. They are engaged. And I think they understand how much is at stake in this election. And to Tara's point, I think people are completely exhausted by this. I think one of the most powerful things out there is the question, 
do you really want to do this for another four years? <laughs> and that's what made that press conference on Thursday night. The contrast was so great. You had the happy warriors out there with their optimism and everything. And here you have the dark, gloomy, dystopian Donald Trump. This is Donald Trump losing as opposed to Donald Trump with the wind at his back. And that's a hard dynamic to change. And you said something, Harry, that's kind of interesting. And I hope people don't gloss over it. This cool thing, which is manifesting itself by the organic reaction on social media, is significant, particularly with, with young voters, because Joe Biden was not cool. I found it almost incomprehensible that Donald Trump was kind of tr was trouncing Biden on TikTok and social media. Well, that's now been reversed. And I will say that Donald Trump, the, I was looking at his face yesterday, he, with his lizard reptilian instinct, he knows it. He gets it. There's a couple of very big differences, too. Much to the chagrin of Bill Clinton, Hillary did not listen to him about going to those places like Wisconsin and understanding she needed to shore up that blue wall. There was a lot of conflict in that campaign between Bill Clinton and his instincts and his people trying to give Hillary advice about what to do to win those folks. And the makeup of the people in her campaign, like having her campaign headquarters in Brooklyn, those little things were they were very out of touch with the base voters that they needed to win. And it, we saw the types of voters that she lost. So just a little aside, a little political history on that. Bill Clinton knew because he had the, those instincts and Hillary was hell bent on trying to prove she could do it without him. <laughs> um, I understand. Listen, I get it. But there were mistakes that were made and a certain amount, I think, of arrogance and blind spots to the demographics that she needed to shore up to win that they ended up losing to Trump. This time around, it's completely different. They know you have a lot of Obama's senior people who helped him get elected not once but twice that understand how to win those voters with Pluff and some of those others that are now involved with the Kamala campaign. You know, with all due respect to Biden's people who had been there for a long time and they were smart, too. But I think they were running a different type of campaign that wasn't with the current times. Now they were in a little bit of denial, maybe a little bit of a, a cocoon about what it takes to win in this environment against those people with MAGA. Tara, do you think Team Biden now has largely been displaced? Because that's an obvious potential tension. Well, I don't know about largely displaced. I think that they're good for some of the uh, institutional knowledge that they have where like some of those things are still important in politics and you need to have that. But for the most part, bringing in Pluff and those guys was a, a definitely a signal that they needed to ramp this up in a more modern type of campaign. So and that's what you're going to see. Obama knew how to win those folks and, and they're going right back at them right now to win again. Couple things. I had the absolute delight this week of sitting down with Nancy Pelosi to talk to her about her book. She's the smartest politician I've ever come across. And she thought that the Biden team essentially sucked and that they never kind of got it and never had a plan for how to win this thing. I think part of what we're seeing is it's not necessarily a displacement. Jen O'Malley is still there. A lot of the middle level and lower level people are there. Those people are very good. They're very professional, but they've been unleashed. They've been told, okay, now be smart. Now be funny. Now be quick off the draw. They're not having to be this, you know, above it all, presidential tone, ponderous, you know, kind of stuff. So overnight, Suddenly, the campaign is so much better. Their opposition reaction to stuff is tremendous. They're funny. They're quick. They're great. And the best part of this is Trump is decomposing before our eyes. And what absolutely gets him is the crowd size. No one has ever had bigger crowds. Adolf Hitler begs to differ. But Martin Luther King, right? Yeah, Martin Luther King, too. You know, there have been bigger crowds. I mean, you could just see his brain exploding. He can't stand it. This is exactly where I wanted to go. So let's formally go to the other guys. Trump hasn't always been able to make everything go his way. But one thing he's had no trouble doing from the escalator walk is getting more than his fair share of media attention. And now he really does seem like a man starved for oxygen. So we're now focused on the the doer, older, nastier, dystopian Trump Vance team. 
I really do have a question as to why he's not out. Is it because they can't fill those venues? Is it because he really is kind of sick? I mean, why he's doing two events a week, not six? Right, and kind of sick and tired. You know, we know he, like, loves going out there with his people. So, like, what is it? You know, he comes up with this clearly bogus excuse, well, the DNC is going on. Well, that's not happening for two weeks. Um, he's essentially taking off the whole month. So what is that all about? Is he just feel like he doesn't even want to compete? He doesn't want to see that his crowds are smaller? I mean, the Kamala Harris people are so funny and so smart. They actually put up a split screen of the same auditorium that Trump had with all of the empty seats and that Kamala Harris had, which was overflowing. I saw that and I just laughed. They've learned the audience of one strategy here. They know how to completely unwind Donald Trump. And they know because he's so transparent. I mean, we're not really, are we really learning anything new about him? No, he's so easy to predict. They know that seeing the enthusiasm, the electricity and the crowd size that would drive him crazy. And when he's in that mode, he makes himself look even more insane than usual. And he goes out and he makes mistakes, just like what we saw during that press conference. So it's not an accident. I give a shout out to the Harris campaign advance team for making sure those visuals are basically ripping from what Trump thought he owned. The hangar with the Air Force Two in the background, that was Trump's thing. That's what he would do. And she went out there and did that with swagger. Swagger. Good, one. Good word. They don't have it anymore, right? Kamala Harris came on that stage, handled those protesters, the Hamas Gaza protester people, and she handled that. Her tone, her pace. She made a deal with the All devil or something. It's just perfect. I know. No, no. <laughs> no, she didn't. You know what it is? She learned. It's clear. Like, I was skeptical of Kamala Harris before. You know, I was one of those people who was like, I don't know if Biden should drop out of this thing because I wasn't sure she was going to be able to step into the role and that the Democrats would be able to unify behind her because they don't exactly have a history of being unified quickly. You have a supposition why Trump is, is so... Oh, yeah. Uh, why he's not doing the rallies? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple things. One, I think that his campaign folks like La Civita and Wiles are watching him make these mistakes while he's out there in public. We saw what he did at the National Association of Black Journalists. We saw what he did in Georgia attacking a very popular Republican governor and his wife. This is not helping him gain the votes that he needs to win. So Wiles and La Civita are very seasoned political operatives. They understand how this works. Now they're getting to the point where they cannot control their principal anymore. They can't control Trump anymore. And I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see some shakeups. I think we've already heard about possibly Kellyanne Conway coming back in. But this is what happened. So they're not rushing out there to put him in front of people because of how he's behaving. He's throwing a temper tantrum. Number two, to Jen's point, they are having trouble filling these events. Trump's rallies have been noticeably smaller since he's been on the campaign trail. They're noticeably smaller. He's not filling 30,000 seat arenas or events anymore. He's not. And they don't want to risk that visual. He can run out there and to say that he has the greatest crowds bigger than Martin Luther King all he wants. We see, we have visual evidence, okay? We can see the difference. So if that's what he's focusing on, he's losing. And his people know this. So they're trying to figure out what the strategy is going to be when they put him out here. If we're going to put him out, we have to make sure we put him out and if the visual is what we want and he's going to say at least somewhat what he needs to say. And he's not capable of doing that right now. And number three, he's four years older. The guy doesn't look great. I don't know whether he's on Ozempic or not, but it was clear that he looks very gaunt. He looked tired. He looks disheveled more so than usual. I think they've decided to lay off the bronzer or they ran out of it because he looked also almost pale. So the side-by-side -side comparison... They're trying to figure it out because you see Kamala, she looks rested, refreshed, younger, more vigorous. And even Tim Waltz, who's only six months older, <laughs> looks better than Donald Trump, who is now officially the oldest candidate to ever run for president of the United States. I think this is actually a, a really interesting question. The fact that he is he is not out there campaigning and where he's campaigning is in Bozeman, Montana. Now, this is my mother's hometown. I love Bozeman. It's a great place. But it's like, what? You know, of all the places to go here, and I'm not sure that they're afraid to put him out there because, frankly, he loves the rallies. You know, the, the rally uh, tends to cover up 
his flaws. So I had two thoughts about this. Number one, he did not look well yesterday. And I do wonder whether or not his health and his energy level is, is down. Uh, I don't want to speculate beyond that. And secondly, could we all just remember that it wasn't that long ago that he was shot and almost killed at a rally. And I kind of wonder whether that's a factor in his mind that, you know, I don't want to go out there. It's dangerous. It's scary. Because you think about what he has done since then. He hasn't gone out as much. So, and then, by the way, you can hardly blame him. He is a 78-year-old man who uh, was almost shot in the head. And I think that that is affecting his thinking. But I, I don't know because there's no real strategy reason why you would take the month of August off, especially when those rallies have always been the centerpiece of his campaign, and he loves them. And by the way, one of the things about that press conference yesterday, a reporter mentioned, actually one of your colleagues, Jen, mentioned that a lot of that incoherent press conference was his rally stuff, but when you take away the applause and all the crowds and everything— it's sort of like, you know, draining the swamp and seeing what's there. It's like he's exposed. He's much better off in the rally than he is in that kind of an environment. That's what I wanted to ask you, really, all three of you. But I think he has lost his mojo in a lot of ways. And his supporters, he'll get up and say all kinds of crap. They don't care. All kinds of lies. They don't care. But he has this overall bravado and sort of contempt and starkiness to the extent he's just a deflated figure. Does that actually translate into rallies cutting in the other direction and accentuating the contrast with the young, vigorous, upbeat, joyous Democratic ticket? It's the fat Elvis thing, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. You come to see the, the Elvis concert and, yeah. and you're getting kind of the low energy, drugged up fat Elvis. What's worse than going out? And looking like Fat Elvis is standing in a ballroom in Mar-a-Lago without the applause. You clearly know that was not his aide's idea. That was clearly him having to go out there to get attention, to defend himself because he felt like no one was doing it. And it had to have been like one of the worst days of his political career since he came down that escalator. It was terrible. All right, let's 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 actually go to this now. The press conference was pretty impromptu. Now he's going to do it. I think he's wanting to show a contrast, suggesting that Kamala Harris isn't doing a press conference. I don't think that really has much purchase. But a smorgasbord of lies and crazy claims. And all of you, I think, are panning it. Objectively speaking, how bad was the press conference? You know, it's weird. It was probably his worst performance ever. If you compared it, I think it was objectively worse in some ways than Biden's debate performance. And the press kind of pretends that everything is just the same. They've become so inured to Trump that it's like they don't even react anymore. They don't even say, by the way, this was even for Trump, a new level of batshit crazy. This was a new level of like unhingedness. And I go back and forth between thinking that because they see him every day, they've just kind of gotten endured to it, and a more maniacal explanation, which is they like the horse race, they don't want to pick sides, they want to kind of keep the battle going. And so in some ways, they either deliberately or inadvertently overlook how insane this has gotten and how bad he sounds and how bad he looks. Yes, he didn't have the raspy voice, but he did look wane. He did look thin. And he was clearly, you know, distressed on many levels. He just didn't get that kind of reaction in the coverage. And I thought it was like bizarre. You know, I went and looked at some of the other publications, which are news publications, they're not opinion. And they had a much better grasp of it than I think many of the mainstream outfits. I looked at The Guardian, I looked at Vanity Fair, and they were like, God, this was a disaster. And the rest of the press is just like, oh, well, another day in paradise. Well, this is a really important point about the asymmetry of our politics, because if Kamala Harris came out and gave a performance like that, it would be a complete disaster, exactly. right? And yet it's for Donald Trump, it was just a Thursday. And it's hard to say that he was more unhinged because he's never been hinged in the first place. <laughs> but I mean, you know, part of it was, OK, this is Donald Trump. He comes out with a fire hose of bullshit, you know, all of the insults and everything. That's not new. What was new is that he looked shrunken. He looked rattled like a frightened man. This is what Donald Trump looks like when he's losing. Donald Trump does not have a cope for losing. You know, he has been the alpha male, the apex predator, 
the winner. And you saw something. He looked he looked weak. He looked like he was five minutes away from, you know, please clap. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I think people are going, well, I, what I wrote was like, what the hell did we just see there? What was that? You know, what in the name of God, the former president of the United States going on for an hour. I mean, yeah, he's got the obvious, very severe crowd envy, but put together in that environment, here's a guy who clearly has lost his mojo. And I think that it's one thing for us to say this, but- that's that's who it was. Now, again, reality check. It's August 8th. It's the middle of the day. People are out living their lives. They're not necessarily paying attention. But he's 78 years old. He's not going to get better. The directional arrow is not toward, you know, more charisma and more energy. <laughs> Well, I also think that there is a certain journalistic malpractice that mainstream media isn't running the headlines constantly. Where's the New York Times with the 50 freaking editorials and five front page articles about everything we just said, which is objectively true. There's no really no editorial necessarily in describing what that was. And the fact that there seems to be two set of rules when it comes to how Donald Trump is judged on his behavior and what he says versus how everybody else is is really infuriating, especially at this point in time after what we've seen for all these years and the damage that this has caused. The fact that there is some type of moral equivalence here is just insane. And even some other cable news channels that seem to just gloss over Donald Trump's insanity and just questionable competence here is very frustrating, too. I mean, if you look at this morning, some cable news channels, not all, have just glossed over it. They're covering, you know, uh, floods in South Carolina and they're, you know, as if it's just a regular Friday day. Now, not saying that's not important, but the guy freaking lost it for an hour and 15 minutes making up things about going down in a helicopter with Willie Brown never happened. Probably good 25, 30 percent of it was uh, the crowd envy nonsense, which is just not normal behavior for anyone. Never mind someone we're supposed to entrust to be the leader of the free world again. No one seems to think anything's wrong with that. Going on about Kamala's race again and saying that he doesn't have a problem with her being black or Indian or whatever she is like, that's OK. Numerous other things that he said that should be disqualifying. But yet. To Charlie's point, it's another Thursday afternoon. That is the media's fault because we listen for months and months and months and months and months and then day after day about Joe Biden's age. Well, where the hell is all of that concern and all of that scrutiny for Donald Trump? He needed Joe Biden to be a foil. Right. Yes. And now suddenly, who's the old guy in the race? Who's right. the, the candidate with cognitive dissonance? They've spent years saying we ought to focus on you know how old somebody is and you know, whether they're in cognitive decline. Well- no, they can't play the whataboutism card with Joe Biden. And so I think that has also changed the dynamic, how much of the Trump campaign was based on that, because now he is the oldest man. He wins. He'd be the oldest man by far to be sworn in. He would have the nuclear codes when he's 82 years old. But I don't care if he's 35 years old. He shouldn't have the nuclear codes if he behaved that way. <laughs> but to Charlie's point, he looks it. Yeah, he I, does. You know, I was at the trial not long ago. And I, you know, I think this is the sort of unifying theme to both our points so far is just when you actually see it. I'm here to tell you the naked emperor is not a pretty sight. Again, the Harris campaign is just playing it perfectly. You know, they send out these, you know, responses like, is he okay? Yes. Yes. The press release that they put out, right? They said whatever the hell that was right. Right. <laughs> responding to the con press conference. They sound like us now. They sound like. Twitter, you know, commentary, and it's just fabulous to read. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, the question bubbles up around the difference between champagne and sparkling wine, and we're more than happy to explain. First things first, champagne is a type of sparkling wine, but not all sparkling wine is champagne. We could leave it at that, but that's not our style, so here we go. A sparkling wine can only be called champagne if it comes from the region of Champagne in France. 
Any other bubbly produced outside of Champagne is called sparkling wine. In this exclusive region of northern France, three types of grapes, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier, come together to produce what will become the Champagne you know and love. Champagne production is controlled by strict laws, so all of those grapes we just mentioned must be hand-picked. It's a labor of love, right? The other difference comes from the fermentation process, specifically the second fermentation process that produces Champagne's signature bubbles. This time-consuming fermentation takes place in the bottle and is known as the traditional method, whereas some sparkling wines are fermented in a tank. Now take a wine like Cava, which is made in the Champagne method, but because it's produced outside the region of Champagne, it's classified as, yep, you guessed it, sparkling wine. So if it's sparkling wine you want, Total Wine & More has a huge selection, including Prosecco, which comes from the Veneto region of Italy, Sec, from Austria and Germany, and Cremant, which comes from France, just outside of the Champagne region. But all these sparkling wines have something in common. They're amazing bottles that are available at Total Wine & More for you to take home, pop open, and compare, not only to each other, but to Champagne as well. Happy shopping and happy popping. Cheers! Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. Let's take a minute or two to talk about a case involving Donald Trump, the Arizona prosecution. We will accept the stipulation before you even have to say it. Charlie and Terry, you are not lawyers. <laughs> Nevertheless, we're not talking about the law part. Jenna Ellis, remember her? She agrees to cooperate. You know, Rudy Giuliani, especially Mark Meadows, John Eastman, Boris Epstein. How threatening is her cooperation for them? They've all, through a combination of some borrowed luck from Trump and other things, have, have stayed pretty out of the fray. But big development? Well, to begin with, remember, Trump is not a party in the Arizona case. There are the other electors. So it is possible, again, none of this, I think, is really going to come out before the election, but that we will get a more complete telling of the tale. Ellis may be able to fill in some blanks in terms of what Trump said and what the direction was from the White House and the rest of it. So we'll see. There's cooperation and then there's cooperation, as we all know. If they have that piece of paper and they've, she's gotten such a good deal. And one thing about Jenna Ellis Normally, you have a sort of low-level person. She is in the center of things. She's shoulder to shoulder. She's shoulder to dripping ink. And she was aggrieved, right? They put her out in the cold. That's right. They screwed her over. And that was something that she was like, she got thrown out, like discarded. And now she's trying to save her own skin. So hell hath no fury like a former Trump staffer scorned. There's been plenty of them. And so she has every incentive to tell the truth and spill all the beans. And the fact that it's in Arizona is important also because Arizona is a critically important state right. that could make or break this election. It will be very close there. And it will give people a reminder of what these crazies tried to do in 2020. Yesterday, also during that press conference, he tried to say that there was a peaceful transfer of power and tried to gaslight us all into believing January 6th wasn't what it was. And nobody died. Nobody died. Five police officers right, died as right, a result yeah. of January 6th. A woman got shot because she was trying to, as a crazy person, trying to attack Nancy Pelosi in the speaker's office. I mean, there were other people there. That was a horrible day. We all saw it. And 140 police officers were critically hurt during that day. So let's like stop that. So anytime that conversation comes back up and people are reminded of that awful, awful day and are they're reminded that this guy tried to commit a coup pretty much. That day is not a good day for Donald Trump, especially for moderate voters in swing states like Arizona. And something else happened in Arizona as well. The first, there are 11 state actors and then seven of the federal. But the 11 state actors are sort of prominent in the Republican Party. And the first one got a very good deal. Mm -hmm. If this goes to form, you're going to see maybe a domino effect. And that just has to, that kind of odor has to settle somewhat on the Republican Party. And as Tara said, in a very, very close race, if that kind of is freight they have to carry, that could matter. They just threw out the reporter from Maricopa County, who was somebody who did his job and was one of the, you know, if you will, the heroes. And that does kind of raise in my own mind how much people even remember or how 
that sways the electorate. It's just another data point that reminds us that average voters don't necessarily think about these things in the way we do. So I think we should keep in mind and also that this is not going to go to trial before the election. So it may have some muted impact. Also, a bunch of Republican officials in Arizona have endorsed Kamala Harris. And so that's important, too, because those moderate Republicans who are not comfortable with what happened in 2020, not comfortable with Donald Trump and the direction of the party, they need a permission structure to not vote for Donald Trump and vote for Kamala Harris. So that type of endorsement, I think, is important for people to see. There's a reason why these Republicans have come out and said, no way, we're, we're going to go with her. That, again, goes to our earlier point that policy differences do not matter anymore. It's about rule of law protecting our democracy and our constitutional norms and institutions. So I think that also can have a factor. And then not for nothing, but Arizona was also another one of those places where the Republicans overstepped on the issue of abortion and women's rights. And there's a ballot initiative there, and that is going to motivate women to come out and vote. And they look at what's going on, and women, moderate women, do not like this do not like what's going on there. And the idea of losing freedoms and the idea of J.D. Vance calling women childless cat ladies or going after IVF and what families look like, they don't want that for their future, for not only for themselves, but for the future for their daughters and granddaughters. So all of those things are a toxic stew for Republicans out there in Arizona that could make the difference. We're talking small numbers here. Right. That's the thing. It's always small numbers. And uh, yeah, Rusty Bowers country, right? The Arizona voters also saw... Someone was telling the truth, someone wasn't. And to your other point, I'll just say, by the way, that this is exactly the kind of work that you're now doing with the Seneca Project. And it's those sort of soft spots, if you want to put it that way, I think that you're really effectively targeting. Thank you. I'll just make one prosecutor's point. I don't overstate or hold my breath for every possible consequence for Donald Trump. But you just got to say, we learned already they wanted to indict him and for bizarre and, and inaccurate reasons. The prosecutors talked them down. But look, so far, Mark Meadows in particular, but Rudy Giuliani, who's a hopeless, complete deadbeat, etc., and others, they're looking at actual time in state jail. They've got one card and one card only to play. And if it's next year and Trump hasn't won, will they offer that up? So in that sense, if I'm just Donald Trump's lawyer, this is something I'm really keeping my eye on. Just want to quickly echo Tara's point about IVF. That's another benefit that Tim Walls brings because he had an experience, a personal yes. experience that he can talk about. That's a really powerful issue for him to talk about in middle America. They named their daughter Hope because of what they went through with IVF. The story is beautiful Amazing. and she is beautiful. Their relationship is beautiful and you people get to see that visual. And that narrative is a very, very powerful one. And for us at the Seneca Project, where we're targeting moderate women, particularly right of center, to galvanize those women and, and left of center, too. They need a little shoring up with some things, but mo mainly the right of center women to go out there and vote for the Harris ticket. Now, we didn't we really didn't care who was at the top of the ticket at this point, as long as Donald Trump was not their choice. And the issue of IVF is a salient one, not only for women, but for dads. And those dads, you can stay tuned for some of the messaging coming from us from Seneca Project about this issue because the girl dads matter and Tim Waltz embodies that perfectly. All right, out of time, just about. We got only our talking five. And the question today is, so Trump tried very hard with this press conference, which has been widely panned, at least by us. What is Donald Trump's next move for media attention Five words or fewer, please. Replace Vance with Tucker Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> good. That would be good. Yeah. Uh, you're, I'm along the same lines. Trump fires everyone, installs Junior. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on, which he really can do with all the petroleum and stuff, set his hair on fire. Thank you so much, Jan, Tara, and Charlie. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also subscribe to Talking Feds' YouTube channel, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. 
You can follow us on Twitter at Talking Feds Pod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon. Talking Feds remains a completely independent production, one of the very few. So if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Thanks for tuning in. And don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Catherine Devine, associate producer Gabriella Glick, sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin, Hamsa Mahandranathan, David Lieberman, and Emma Maynard are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Akshaj Turbailu. Our music, as always, is by the amazing Philip Glass. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. Bye.